In his song, Anthem, Leonard Cohen writes, you can add up the parts, but you won't have the sum. You can strike up the march, but there's no drum. Every heart, every heart to love will come, but like a refugee. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. One of the things you'll hear over and over in this room is that church is for proclaiming liberty to the captives, for binding up the broken heart, the brokenhearted and setting the prisoner free. One of the things that keeps us prisoner is some kind of idea of perfection, that there are things that should have no cracks in them and that if they have a crack, they're less than ideal anymore, that there can be perfect relationships and that if there's a mistake made or a fight or a, a wrong done, then the relationship is somehow compromised or scarred less than it once could have been. The poet writes, every heart to love will come but like a refugee. We seem to try everything else but love. First, we're driven by perfection and we live in the land of perfection until we're driven out from the land of perfection. We become a refugee into the land of, oh, I don't know, what's next after perfection? Control. We try to control everything that we can control. If it can't be perfect, by God, I'll never let that happen again. And then we're driven, if we're lucky, from the land of control. And we let go. And then we live in the land of despair. Nothing works out anyway. I don't care. If you care, you'll just get disappointed. I try not to give my hopes up. If you're even luckier, you're driven out of the land of despair into the land of cynicism, which is fun. <laughs> and you get to say things like, no matter how cynical I get, I just can't keep up. <laughs> but that's dull after a while. If you're not bored, rest assured that you are boring. And, um, <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> then you might come into the land of love. Your path might not go through those lands into the land of love, but if you are lucky and blessed, you will be driven like a refugee into the land of love. And you try love. And because I have to tell you the truth, I have to say that it's usually for many of us temporary, at least at first, we try love and it works, but then for some reason we quit trying it. So we, we go back to control or despair or cynicism or even perfection because we've found love again and this time it's going to be perfect. Oh, my dears. May our heart always come home even like a refugee to the land of love. So how do we live with cracks in our relationship? How do we live with cracks in our experience of church? How do we live with cracks in our expectations of ourselves? One of the ways of living with the cracks is by the practice of forgiveness. If we do not practice forgiveness, then our scars can hold us hostage. <clears throat> Picture them like those monstrous vines in the fairy tales that just hold you down until you can't move anymore. Our scars can get that bad. We don't practice forgiveness, then we don't ever become supple again. And we are held hostage by our resentments. And um, it's not all bad. You get hostage. You he you're held hostage by resentments. But the whole time, you get to watch a movie. The whole time you're held hostage by your resentments, you get to watch this movie. And the movie is of the thing that happened. It plays over and over a little bit differently every time. We play over and over the thing that happened, and we wait for an apology. 
Now, I want to say that when I talk about forgiveness, I'm talking about wrongs that were done to people. Some people think of a fight they had with a spouse or a parent or a kid. Some people think about a bad boss that they have or um, just a fight with a good boss. And some people are thinking of horrible, heinous things, rape and incest and I want you to know that I am not making light of any of these things, and I want you to know that this sermon is just for you to hear and take whatever is good for you in it and let the rest go. So what I want to ask is that you listen as you're able, and you are the only one who can say when it's time to forgive someone else or yourself or God. Some people, now non-believers, again, you can relax about this, but some people who um, are believers in a God of some kind feel that God hasn't forgiven them for something. And some people live as if they haven't forgiven God, which is another way of believing. (laughs) Um, You're just mad. It's a faithful response. Read the Hebrew scriptures. Being mad at God is okay. It means that you're in relationship. So we're talking about forgiveness because forgiveness is um, related to emotional and physical and institutional healing. There are many studies that show that resentments are bad for your health. Every religion of the world says forgiveness is important. And so I would be remiss not to talk about it. One of the things that's bad for you is is going through life in the role of wronged, innocent victim. It's a very tempting role. It has uh, all your lines are given to you, really. You don't have to think much. You're the innocent victim and... Um, sometimes that's enough identity for somebody's whole life. Another thing that's wrong with it is that um, you are filled with impotent anger. And I'll preach about anger another time, but I just want to say that when I say impotent anger, I mean anger that doesn't have any fruitful force in it. Anger that won't help you cook anything or grow anything. Uh, some anger has a lot of good juice in it. And other anger is just uh, doesn't get you anywhere. So, um, more about that later, another day. Uh, Forgiveness is hard. I just want to say that right up front. It's difficult because when we're wronged, uh, you know, when you get a muscle hurt, you kind of tense up and you you can't be flexible and fluid. Um, When your emotions are hurt, you get tense and and stiff. And... um, And sometimes you get righteous. And I've told you before that I think righteousness is the root of all evil. When you start feeling righteous, look out, because you're about to do something bad. (laughs) Um, The the righteousness is... is, um, fills up that movie that you're watching. The movie when you're held hostage by your resentments, you watch this movie and you watch over and over again what the person did or what they said to you. And um, in the movie, if, if yours is like mine, uh, I don't know you well enough yet to be talking about your movie, but I'll talk about mine. Um, in the movie, you articulate your point of view with just the right amount of calm and um, just the right amount of edge and uh, kindly, but firmly, and uh, since you practiced it so much, it's very articulate, almost poetic sometimes. <laughs> and the end is the best part. In the end of the movie, uh, the person who has wronged you gets it. They go, oh, I, I'm so sorry. I was wrong. 
And if it's a really good movie, they go, I was wrong and you, you were so right. <laughs> you were right. And uh, how could I not have seen it? Uh, what can I do to make it up to you? I... Some of us watch the movie so many times that we can really drop into that groove of telling the story, into the groove of uh, our arguments, our recrimination, our resentment. We can lull ourselves to sleep with the, with the recitation. The, the resentment becomes part of our, our psyche's clothing, part of our identity, and it feels... It feels good to be able to go to somebody, um, again, not making fun of you, making fun of me, uh, to go to somebody and tell them what happened and uh, see them go, oh, no, they did not do that. And you're like, yes, yes, they did. <laughs> it's interesting to notice the people you go to tell a story to, because everybody's got some friends that won't do that, some friends that'll go, well, you know, you shouldn't have. So you have to let them know ahead of time, especially if it's a family member. Um, you have to say, okay, I'm gonna tell you this story and I do not want you to be reasonable. <laughs> I want you to be on my side. You be on my side this time, you can be reasonable next time. But now, the first time through, I want you to go, oh, they did not, those rats. Very satisfying. And the harm in that is that you get stuck, get stuck in that righteousness. And when you're stuck, you start sleepwalking through your life. And we want to be awake. We want to be awake because a spiritual life, I think, is a spirited life, and a spirited life is not a sleepwalking life. And so if you're stuck to a resentment, or if you're stuck in a groove of telling a certain story over and over again, this part of your identity, then you're also stuck to the person who hurt you, and you're also uh, easily um, knocked back into that groove of being hurt. And sometimes you're just wired so that you jump into the role of being a victim for a lot of different interactions. It's, it becomes the familiar response, and that harms you. It makes you less free. We want to be. We want to be free. But if you're always resenting, if you don't forgive, they say it's like holding a hot coal in your own hand, you know, not forgiving someone. Uh, the Course in Miracles, which some of you have studied, says you can be right or you can be happy. So one way of letting go of someone who's stuck to you because they hurt you, one way of letting go is something I stole straight from the 12-step program called the resentment prayer. Um, the resentment prayer is amazingly powerful magic. I, had, I was praying it for my little sister one time because she's, um, you know, my dad got married again um, to a woman who's the age of my little sister. And then they started having children who are now the ages of my children. And um, the first daughter they had, who is my second sister, um, she was a freaking genius. She was, she was a preemie. She came out weighing two pounds. And now she, you know, and then she started reading by the time she was two and a half. And then she learned, like, I don't know, Italian, German, French, and Welch because she wanted to study the Arthurian legends. And then she learned to fence because that looked interesting. And I mean, she just can, like, walk past somebody on the street and then, then she speaks their language. I don't know. How she does it. <laughs> and so I had a little resentment. So the resentment prayer goes like this. You pray for that person, everything that, that you want in your life, you pray it for them. So I'd be like, dear God, please help her have, uh, be healthy and have enough money and um, drive a reliable car and have nice friends and, you know, like that. And I had this friend named Dorothy, actually her name was Dorothy. 
uh, I don't know why everybody called her Dorothy, but they did. Anyway, uh, so Dorothy taught me this prayer, and Dorothy said, Meg, and the good thing is you don't have to mean it. <laughs> I said, really? Uh, really? She said, yeah. When I, um, she said, when my sponsor told me about this prayer, uh, I was praying it for my mother, she said. I was praying it for my mother, she said. And she said, um, I said to my sponsor, but I would not mean it. I do not want to be a hypocrite. And my sponsor said, Dorothy, you're a drunk. God forbid you should be a hypocrite. So I started praying it for my little sister, and then it started working, so I had to quit. <laughs> uh, writer and Jungian psychologist Clarissa Pinkola Estes says, forgiveness seems unrealistic because we think of it as a one-time act that has to be completed in one sitting. Forgiveness has many layers, many seasons. It is not all or nothing. If you can do a 95% forgiveness, you're a saint. 75% is wonderful. 60% is fine. The important part is to begin and to continue. There's a healer inside who will help you if you get out of the way. For some, temperamentally, she says, this is easy. For some, it is harder. You're not a saint if it's easy. You're not a bad person if it's not easy. You're who you are, and you do it the way you do it, all in good time. She also writes that forgiveness does not mean that you overlook something, or that you ignore bad behavior. You, there are ways to begin. The first way to begin is just to be willing to begin. And then you give yourself a break from thinking about it for a while. You forego talking about it. Whenever you find yourself in that groove, you say, oh man, there I go again. Let's think about something else for a while. You don't have to forget it. Um, then you can decide how much you can forgive, and then you can decide how much you can forget, because sometimes the person's dangerous, and you don't want to be around them anymore. You just have to forgive them from a distance. But, you know, over the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, it says, forgive, but don't forget. Because sometimes if you forget, you let it happen again. I think it's a good idea to have a little ritual to mark the event. Again, uh, if you were here last week, we talked about how your brain sometimes doesn't think in words, it thinks in pictures or actions, and if you can do something concrete to say, I'm beginning to forgive, then that helps. Either, um, either write down on a piece of paper, I am beginning to forgive, and stick it on your dresser, or make a knot in a ribbon, maybe, and say, when I'm ready to begin to forgive, I'm gonna undo that knot. It helps your brain. I uh, found the resentment prayer again in Buddhism because you know the Buddhists come up with everything first, <laughs> but they never say, I told you so. <laughs> it's called the loving kindness meditation, the metta meditation. So I'd like to end this sermon by doing that with you, and I'll say a line and you say it after me if you care to. Um, and we'll say it the, we're going to say it three times through. We're going to say it first time for ourselves because sometimes you have to get solid with your own self first before you can begin to be spiritual when it comes to other people. Okay, here we go. This is for ourselves. May I be free from danger. May I be mentally happy. May I be physically happy. May I have ease. May I have ease. May I have ease.
of well-being. <laughs> 